You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. We always appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get to this week's guest, reminder, our website is live, hazardground.com. Go back and check out previous podcast episodes, get more pictures, bios on our guests, and a lot of great information about what we have coming up next. Also, don't forget to write us a rating and review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Play, also on Spotify, all the places you can get the Hazard Ground. We really appreciate the ratings and reviews. Certainly help us get the word out there about the podcast and help us continue to get you guys some great guests each and every week. Joining us now on the Hazard Ground podcast, he is a former Marine Corporal and his story is one that everyone needs to hear because of the inspirational tale that has come after his tour in Afghanistan where he lost both of his legs. Let's welcome Brian Aft to the Hazard Ground Podcast. Brian, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Uh, pleasure to be here, man. Thanks for having me. All right, so we always start out the podcast by asking, why did you join the military? Well, I mean, I was kind of a typical screw-up in high school, but I mean, I kind of had to fix that. So that was a huge huge factor in joining but um i mean shoot after you know really seeing the whole thing in action especially once you get in afghanistan you develop quite an appreciation for it well when you say that you were a screw-up i mean was there anything in particular that led you to the decision were your parents pushing you there or was it something you just said hey i need to get my life on track well uh kind of both actually um i was uh 17 and two weeks before my 18th birthday um my freaking parents found uh some uh some needles and stuff in my drawer and that did not go over too well. And I ended up in a, uh, rehab out in Los Angeles a couple of weeks before my 18th birthday and ended up there for like, uh, probably like five months as a inpatient. And then I started, you know, kind of helping out the handyman there. So they let me move into like the technical sober living side and my roommate, and that was a prior service Marine, and he told me all about it and everything. And after uh, checking out of there, ended up in the, whatchamacallit, the recruiter's office at the Valley View Mall that I don't think is there anymore. All right, so when you go to the recruiter's office, what do you tell them, and what did they tell you? I just asked how it worked, and they just pretty much start explaining. And, you know, you got you got to wait depending on what your job is. Maybe you wait longer to go to boot camp and stuff. I told them I just wanted to go. And he's like, all right, well, you know, uh, just to you know, look at these job things, you know, and this is after taking the ASVAB and the god awful waiting process and everything over at the MEP station in Dallas. Just for those listening, again, the ASVAB, just an aptitude test to kind of figure out what military skills that you have. And, you know, MEPS, as we've said several times, the medical and processing station uh, at the military where guys can be held up for a while. Uh, but let me ask you, what's interesting is that a lot of people who we've talked to, uh, especially people who, you know, fought in the war in Iraq and the one in Afghanistan, there was always a sense of patriotism about everybody who wanted to sign up. I, I get the feeling that that wasn't really part of the impetus for you. Like, not to say that you weren't patriotic or you didn't love your country, but that wasn't really the driving force. With a lot of guys, it's not initially, but you start to, that's why I was saying, like, you develop, once you actually see it, the U.S. military really in action doing what they do while, you know, out in that crap hole of the world, you develop quite an appreciation. And then after living in that part of the world, you develop a ridiculous appreciation for every privilege and benefit you were born with being in this country, no matter who you are. So you finally get sent out to Marine Boot Camp. Uh, when you get there, what was your first impression? What were your thoughts? How are you feeling about the decision you'd made? Holy, that was mind blowing. Like the first thing that going through your head, first you're just like a little nervous. You're waiting for the bus to pick you up. And then you don't think much of it when you're on. You're like, okay, so I'll just be bored and depressed a couple months. <laughs> then you actually get there. And then the whole show starts when you're standing on those yellow footprints and you're just like, what in the hell did I agree to? So needless to say, <laughs> you thought you made a bad decision at this point in time. Did you want to get out? I, well, <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know what, uh, ditching this would be nice, but I don't think that's an option. And they also made that very clear. And then I also, the first, like, you know, when you're in the transition platoon or whatever, mm -hmm. waiting to go to your actual drill instructors, 
this one kid that I ended up having to share a rack, a bunk with, and then ended up having to, when we got to our drill instructors, he kept telling me all these ridiculous ideas, how he's going to get out of boot camp. First, he tried the, because it was still don't ask, don't tell back then. Right. I'm going to tell him I'm gay. I'm like, I don't think that's going to work, man. (laughs) (laughs) And, And finally, he pulled the, like, I'm suicidal card, and then he ended up in the little... He just ended up in the, you know, broke group, pretty much. Those are guys walk around in freaking sweats all day with stupid looking frowns on their face. So for you, when you realize you got to tough this thing out, how did the adjustments go? Oh, you just suck it up and uh, try not to think too much, man. That's it. You just do what you're told. That's how that's (laughs) that's how I would say boot camp wasn't as, you know, it, it can be different levels of horrible. It just depends on you. Right. Well, when it's over and you, you finally get through it all and you looked back on it, did you think that it was as tough as you thought it was on your first couple of days? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. That, wow. Wow. They definitely, they know what they're doing training there. I mean, I don't know what they're doing nowadays. I'm not going to talk bad about it and try and pull this, oh, the old school guys, like I heard constantly when I went through. But whatever, you know, um, they know how to make them there, dude, I tell you. (laughs) Well, what did you think was different about yourself when you were done? Yeah, I really don't, I don't know. I don't know, but everything they do to you there prepares you for everything that's going to come next when you get to your unit. I mean, it's just, you know, all to me, I mean, boot camp was just teaching you to be at me. Well, I mean, obviously it's being a basic Marine, but it teaches you to function in a high pressure situation, which is exactly what the Marine Corps is. Right. I hear so much from Marines that you know, the camaraderie that you have with guys after boot camp is, is is really strong so much more so than it would be for the army's basic training or you know navy indoctrination or whatever it may be air force but there's the marines do it a little bit differently did you feel that yes but i will say you know you you the the boot camp bond is one thing but the the bond you got with your guys that you actually when you finally get to the fleet wherever that may be and especially you know you go pretty much sucking today one day at a time doing it together that's what really forms your bonds okay so you get out of marine boot camp and you finally get to your unit where is it what kind of what, what time of year is this you know what what year is it uh, i ended up freaking finally got to camp lejeune the disgusting gross swamp also known as jacksonville north carolina I got there in uh, what April of two thousand eight, okay. and yeah, that was that was that was a depressing sight. <laughs> what was so depressing about it? <laughs> it's just a, a backwoods swamp they slapped a base on. I mean, it's like it's like they lost a bet having to, with the army having to put it there. <laughs> I got stationed with First Battalion, Tenth Marines. That's our artillery battalion on Lejeune. Once they started going to the field and stuff again, that's when you start to suffer together. So that all begins, and I started learning their jobs and just gelled with them. What was some of the suffering you referred to? Oh, you just go out in the field, get freaking pissed, rain on, freezing cold, muddy, gross, swamp, everything. Big, gross, blister, boil thing on your foot. You go out, you, you know, you suffer with your friends. Whether you're doing it in the field or on deployment, and how long are you, you with know, you, how long are you with your first unit? That was my one and only unit. I was with them. Uh, we spent, let's see, we sat at Lejeune just doing a lot of different training for Artie and other things, like two and a half years, and uh, then finally they're like, "Hey, we're going to go to Afghanistan." I'm like, "Sweet, um, I'm going to extend my contract and let's do this," and ended up. Let's see. We did 129 palms exercise. Then after that, the unit was getting ready to go do the second one. 
a mat, a big old cax exercise and freaking me and like 12 other dudes from the unit ended up at IED detector dog school, which was pretty awesome. And for those listening, 29 Palms is just an area in California, in San Bernardino County, where the uh, where the Marines go to train. It's uh, similar to NTC for the Army, the National Training Center around Cal. Just big, flat desert land uh, where you can go out and train. So uh, when you find out you're going to Afghanistan, you decided to extend your contract. Was that because you felt like, okay, now we're going to go into this stuff and it's going to get real and I want to stay for all of it or what? Like what was the timeline as far as having to extend your contract? Well, uh, me, a lot of the guys actually did. Basically, I was, I had, what was it, like six too few months on the books. I didn't, I needed six more months on the books to deploy and, you know, to be, be on their timeline for getting out of the Marine Corps properly and everything. Same thing with a lot of other guys. Going through an entire Marine Corps enlistment and not deploying once or seeing everything in action and doing what your unit does on a deployment, not doing that at all during your entire enlistment. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of embarrassing, man. Well, it's, I mean, we talk a lot about this on the podcast in the sense that you're kind of in the minor leagues when you're doing all the training. You want that call up to the bigs to see if you know what you have, what it takes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I mean, it's not necessarily going to be I, uh, so many, especially young kids. They think like, you know, every, your deployment's going to be like a freaking level of Call of Duty. It's like, no. Nah. One of my buddies even said, nah, don't extend. What are you doing, man? Just take your benefits, take your GI bill and stuff and go freaking do your thing. I'm like, but bro, I've been sitting here bored out of my mind in Lejeune for coming up on three years. You You understand why I'm doing this. He's like, yeah, but I mean come on, dude. Like, no, you come on, dude. You just got back from Afghanistan and you were at freaking Iraq before that. So you can't really sit there and try and convince me not to do this. Well, and and that's fair. Uh, I think there are a lot of guys in your position who sign up and they want to, you know, again, see if they have what it takes. When do you leave for Afghanistan? Uh, When do you get there? Kind of give me the timeline. Let's see. We uh, left at the end of October, and then we were in Afghanistan at the beginning of November. And uh, of two thousand ten. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. My bad. November two thousand ten, and uh, you know, it was about six months into the. De- we we're about six months into the deployment, and that's when uh, we we're on a foot patrol, and we we're heading back to base, and that's when uh, kaboom. All right, well, I'm going to get to that in a minute. I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about first, you know, what was your mission on the deployment and, you know, what was your day-to-day life like there? Oh, the basic um, artillery battalion, uh, it's not going to, obviously, it's not going to be in all one spot. It's not really necessary to have a battalion element of artillery all in one area. But anyway, we're spread out all throughout freaking Helmand province. Um, I think our entire battalion occupied, like, I don't know, like probably like five or six small bases. We uh, do foot patrols. We're our own. You got guys on the gun line. We had two triple seven howitzers. That's just a big gun that fires a hundred pound bullet. We had a couple 81 millimeter mortars. We had guys on observation posts and, you know, we do our own foot patrols. I think I said that that was the first, you know, month and some change of the deployment. And then from there it was to Fiddler's Green, which was, just a fire base, you know, another base with a couple howitzers. We had half of Alpha Battery there and then headquarters there. And then it was just doing security platoons, standing at the ECP, the entry control point. And, you know, after that, um, my buddy Fergie, he got hurt with uh, my dog Buckshot. He, uh, tri- he triggered an explosive, but it didn't go off properly. And is, uh, you know, fortunately... And uh, his, I guess his leg looked like the letter J for a little bit, you know, but uh, he was limb salvaged for a bit, but then he said just chopped it below the knee. But anyway, I replaced him on buckshot, did reset training at Leatherneck, ended up at Firebase Signs, which uh, we were, whatchamacallit, we were 5th Marines artillery support outside of Sangin. So Firebase Signs, that's where that was outside of Sangin. Went there for a few weeks uh, just because the handler for that particular battery was a moron who ruined a $96,000 bomb dog. How did he ruin him? He left him on a freaking 
on a chain on a stake all day. Never did he never did daily training. Even I I trained with Buckshot every day and still got blown up. Buck- Why? Because okay, but Buckshot Buckshot was your, was a marine dog. Just to give for clarification purposes. Why did you guys have the dogs? Um, okay, so you know military police they'll have bomb dogs and stuff. Um, a lot of the time, I guess they're shepherds or Malinois or something. And the Malinois are bite dogs as well. Which, uh, if you don't know what a Malinois is, that's just a Belgian version of a shepherd. It's a little smaller, way more vicious. And what else? Uh, let's see. The IED detector dogs. These are labs. Most of them were black. It really doesn't matter what color they are, I guess. But they're controlled differently. We got a whistle and hand and arm signals. And when you work in them, you take them off the leash. You tell them to heal. They're going to sit by your left heel. They always stay on your left side. Unless, of course, you're a left-handed shooter, then they're going to be on the right side. So you have a couple commands. You can tell them to hunt it up, and they're going to zigzag. And they're going to walk forward in a zigzagging motion, smelling whatever, you know, the direction that you are facing. And the same thing, you can also tell them. You could also just have them run straight back. So let's say, you know, you're facing one direction and, you know, the direct, let's say right in front of you, you think there's, you know, a bomb like 50 feet in front of you and the wind is blowing to your left. You're going to face to your, you know, left at an angle and then you're going to say back and he's going to run straight. And then the wind is going to blow that smell right into his face. And you're going to see what they call a change of behavior. And you're going to see that dog, his head's going to jerk in the direction and with excitement because he knows if he finds it, he gets to play with his toy as his reward. Hey, that's yeah. amazing. I mean, that's a, uh, you, you always see those for, like, for civilians and just people don't work around police dogs like that. When, when, when you see it, it's just amazing. Like, I, I, I'm sure you guys don't have a marvel at it because you work with them every day, so it's just... And, and what kind of connection did you have with, with Buck? Buckshot? I love the guy. I mean, I, God, everybody loved him. Everybody falls in love with him the second they meet him. He's just, he's goofy as hell, and he's the sweetest dog ever. But it's funny, they trained him uh, specifically non-aggressive, so I've literally only heard him bark like three times. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And that was not while active duty. That was all recently in the past, you know, year. All right, so you and Buckshot are out on a foot patrol in, what was it, late April of 2011, correct? Yes, April 18th. What was that morning when you got up, what were you told your mission was, what were you doing? Standard foot patrol, we're going to go out. Maybe we pick a fight. If there's somebody to pick a fight with, there wasn't, so no fight. That sucks. <laughs> um... You know, I mean, it was typical stuff. I mean, we were just going out, just thinking in my head, you know, another day. And I mean, I was having the crazy thoughts, you know, because I like, you know, hey, you know, maybe, you know, you didn't get to do as much of this dog handling stuff as you wanted during this deployment. You know, maybe, maybe you extend and stay with the unit that's replacing you. All these things. You know, thoughts are going in my head. Is like, maybe, you because, yeah, like, literally a month before that, I'm thinking, I'm going to get out soon and go do civilian stuff. But then I'm thinking, you know, I'm actually kind of enjoying this. All but, right. Uh, so I how think do... I'm losing track of what I was trying to well, tell you. <laughs> uh, I'll bring you back. All right, so you're just doing a regular foot patrol for the day. Uh, a couple of hours out there, was it? I mean, what's standard time on, on a foot patrol for you guys? Uh, in, that, in that area, because you're only guarding our initial – we're just trying to keep in that spot. You're just trying to keep the Taliban out. It's not right. like patrolling an entire city and stuff. And we only have one firing battery there. That's like 120 got 25 guys. Maybe that includes officers and dudes that will literally that, that, you know, officers, cooks, guys that don't leave. I mean, technical guys, computer guys, uh, the, the calm guys that will absolutely not be allowed off base because they're too val- excuse me too valuable. Mm-hmm. So they're not sending us to go pick you know find where the <laughs> you know we're not going to even if we see where they you know go bed down at night and whatever we're not going to go raid them and stuff. They're not putting us are the, the only guards and stuff they have at risk like that. So you know we probably you know. Pretty much the whole goal is to keep them at mortar fire distance. Right. So 
if they try and do something stupid, if the guys up on post see people digging and trying to place an IED, they're just like, okay, cool, just mortar the shit at them. All right, we're good. Makes sense. So when you start the foot patrol, how far into it, how long were you out there before your incident happened? Yeah, probably, I don't know, like, it goes by fast, man. Maybe six hours. Oh, wow, really? Not long. Not, I mean, it's not. these aren't long patrols. I mean, these are just during the day. We come back before night hits. All right, know, so- I mean, they vary. Sometimes we'd have meet and greets with some of the fuck. Because, you know, we were patrolling through poppy fields and stuff like that. And sometimes we'd have meet and greets with the farmer and their little little ones and stuff. I mean, or it's just, you know, walking around and checking stuff out. And, uh, yeah. Now, you were told the area you were patrolling was clear of mines, right? Uh, well, okay. It was, you know, it was, it could have been assumed to, it, you could assume that because the first, because we'd ranger filed everywhere. So that's just walking in a straight line with like 15 meters of dispersion in between each Marine. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So the first four guys in the Ranger file, they jumped. We came up across. Uh, we came up on an irrigation ditch, or known as a wadi. Oh. And so the first four guys ahead, they walk up. You know, obviously, you know, we post up, face outwards. You know, as each Marine goes to jump across, and when he jumps across, he moves forward some. And then he kneels down and takes guarding that area. And then, you know, three guys followed that guy. And then it was my turn, me and Buck shots. So, I mean, honestly, I'll be honest with you. I should have I should have searched the area. I should not, you know, you should never make assumptions about anything out there, especially when you're on foot. And, I mean, like, I, you know, I should have freaking searched it because, but, you know, I'm thinking – Hey, you know, we've been doing this the whole time, freaking blah, 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 walking the boot prints of the guys in front of you, and you're good. Well, I mean, it didn't work that time. I was walking in the boot prints of the guy in front of me, and right as when we go to push off, boom, and you don't even really know what's happening until you're on the ground and, you know, you are get recollected, I guess, but it's still. Do you have a vivid memory of, like, what you were looking at right before you took that last step? Uh, just looking across the wadi at the guys on the other side, you know, um, that was it. I looked at them. They're posted up. I walked up with Buck. I'm like, all right, let's do it. And right as I go to push off, I'm like looking across the wadi and then it just black, just this crazy louder than loud. You don't even really hear it because it's just so loud. I mean, your eardrums pop. You know, mine did freaking, um, and it's weird. You, it's more of just a, I don't know. You, it's like a mixture of a thump and a crack all together, but it's so, I mean, you're inside of an explosion. So, I mean, it's, right. it's really hard to describe besides, you know, just sheer terror. There's black everywhere. You can't see anything and up is down, left is right. All right, so when you land and you and you come your body comes to a still, are, are you able to open your eyes? Can you see what's around you? Can you hear anything? Your ears must have been ringing obviously, as you just mentioned. I mean, what can can you take me through kind of coming to? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 god, it's surreal. I mean, it was just couldn't really hear anything. You know, trying to feel around. I mean, I couldn't feel much of anything and it took about it wasn't until about i don't know i'm guessing when i say 10 minutes because i'm not 100 percent. but it was like 10 minutes after that is when i could actually feel my left arm starting to hurt like hell but uh nothing else ended up hurting so that was a plus but um you know waiting on the smoke to clear i mean you know trying to open my eyes there's just a lot of dust and smoke i mean i i can't see very well at all you know i mean I'm trying to look and like assess myself and whatever, but I can't really move all that well. And you know, then I could see I can see I don't have any of my clothes on. I get like the only item it blew it blew me naked. I was butt ass naked with a plate carrier on. Really? Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, uh, the only article of clothing, um, this dude O'Hara, he was in the unit that we replaced. See, unfortunately, I didn't get all the issued items we were supposed to get for the deployment, including um, the flame retardant Nomex gloves. Mm -hmm. So he hooked me up with these. He had these badass older model Blackhawk gloves that I freaking loved, but those got obliterated. <laughs> the only uh, the only article of clothing was the wrist strap on my left wrist for, with the Blackhawk glove that said Blackhawk on it. Wow. That was the only piece of clothing I had on. That's unreal. I could just, I'm just envisioning that. That's that's crazy. So, which one of the first of your teammates gets in front of you that you can see and recognize? Uh, to actually see and recognize, I, it's really it, I couldn't tell you. Um, because basically, like as smoke's clearing, I'm trying to look. I can see my dick is still attached to me, which that was freaking the best moment of my life right there. Brian, let me tell you something. You're not the first guy who's been blown up to echo that sentiment. And I found out from doing this podcast, everybody who's been blown up, it's the first question a male asks. Yeah. <laughs> that was the same thing with my buddy Fergie. He got hit, and then he just starts feeling. He's like, okay, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. A a after Over that, you can that learn to deal with everything. <laughs> everything else is negotiable. <laughs> as long as you got all that in place, you know, you feel like, like you're still a man. Oh, I'm missing half my brain. Hey, we're good, man. We're good. Go. <laughs> exactly. All right. So y those parts are intact. Uh, at what point in time do you start to try to do your own self-assessment of the damage? Um, I couldn't. I couldn't, man. I was trying to feel. I think I felt what was because um, my right, both legs were high as hell above the knees. Uh, my entire left leg, my left leg was just obliterated. It was basically, it, it was the same length of my right leg except just a chunk of my it was just the top it was my femur poking out with a bunch of fucked up meat on it that's all it was and the top that top uh skin mm -hmm. the top the the skin on the top part of your thigh like when you're sitting in a chair and put your hands on your thighs mm -hmm. you know that that skin that was basically peeled back like a banana Ugh. and laying on my pelvis and Ugh. stomach right next to my junk. Wow. You know, I, it took me a minute. I, it was I saw. I remember seeing that when I saw my stuff was still good. You know, I remember seeing that and I didn't know what it was and it wasn't registering in my head that that's what that was until my friends told me about it later. And uh, the first two guys, my buddy. Um, I mean, it's not going to mean anything to anybody to hear their names, but I mean, uh, Kennedy and Lambert, they were the first two guys there. I pretty much, uh, there was a big, that ID left a really big crater in the ground and I landed inside of it. So those two, they jumped down inside. Then they grabbed me by the shoulder straps of the plate carrier and they both dragged my ass out and, uh, I kind of I passed out for a minute when they were dragging me, probably because it hurt, I'd imagine. Well, I was going to say, before you said you didn't feel any pain other than your left arm. So you, you... That's maybe, maybe shock, maybe my body right. trying to not let me deal with it or something. I, I'm not sure. All I know is that it was shortly after that that that's when I was like, guys, my left arm hurts like hell. And... They're like, what about the rest? I'm like, no, I, I, I don't, I can't really feel that right now. But that's also, they hit me with like, turns out they hit me with, uh, have you ever seen those uh, morphine needle pack things that yeah. the medics carry? Yep. Yeah, apparently they hit me with like six of those bitches. <laughs> before they pulled you out of the, before they pulled you out of the hole or no? Uh, after, after, and while during treatment. Cause they were, they, they spent, they spent a minute trying to stop that bleeding. I don't even know how they stopped it before I bled to death, honestly, because, I mean, my, my left femoral artery had to have retracted into my pelvis. Right. You know, I don't even know how you stop that bleeding, but they did it. You know, my corpsman, he had like a grade three or four concussion because he was like right, he was either right, in, no, he was right behind me, I believe. But he's in there. He's guiding the guys. I got my buddy Kelly. He was the litter bear. He carried the stretcher. He was in the back of the ranger file. He came running up. He's strapping. He strapped two tourniquets on my right leg. 
uh, what's from called Ramsey or Corman, him and his badass mustache. And uh, with the help of the other guys, he made this thing. I believe he called it the cradle, which is basically they like wrapped up, you know, kind of like a, they wrapped up my left hip area and stuff. Uh, I guess all they could, I don't know exactly how I didn't physically see it. And I guess they looped up this basically kind of like the same premise of a ratchet strap. They looped it up around my back over my right shoulder and then pulled it down across my chest and then pretty much just tightened it down until they stopped seeing blood come. Wow. So, but you're on foot now. So how long does it take you to get to some place where they can actually start to begin whatever care they can do at that point in time? Uh, when it comes to any, any of the medevacs, they're going to be done because we don't, there's not any country terrorist state, whatever you want to call it, that is going to be able to control the skies at all, really, besides us. So because we own the skies, we got free, you know, free reign on medevacs and airstrikes. So no airstrikes, obviously it wasn't necessary, but British medevac, man, that helicopter, it, it took like an hour to an hour and a half for that guy to show up. But Really? But that's typical, man. People think, good God, an hour, an hour and a half? It's a helicopter. How do you, dude, it's a 40 minute, excuse me, from Kajaki to Camp Leatherneck, it's like 40, 45 minute helicopter ride. Not without anything stupid happening. I mean, and these guys, they're getting called. Half the time they're getting called, they're already picking somebody up in the middle of picking somebody up or dropping somebody off. So, I mean, you're dealing with all that as well, you know? So what are you thinking in this hour and a half that you're waiting? I mean, do you think you're going to die? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was like one of the first thoughts. It's like, well, because uh, at first you're like, no, it's not real. It's not real. It's not real. And then it's like, oh, this is really bad, dude. What were your teammates saying to you? The same stuff they train you. Know, hey, man, you're all good. Everything's good. They're talking to me like I didn't hear this, but freaking I guess my buddy was trying to have a sense of humor and like, you know, because I was naked as hell, and he just like, hey, you're making me look bad here. I'm kind of jealous of you, <laughs> you know, t- trying right. to say like I'm bigger than him. But honestly, I just think I was really swollen because I just took an explosion with my body. But uh, freaking, you know, I mean, they're just talking to me, trying to keep me awake. I think at one point, I mean, my memory is hazy, but I think at one point I tried to freaking close my eyes to nap a little bit, and they weren't definitely weren't having that, you know. Right. Like, no, 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 you can't be doing that. And I'm like, oh, come on. I mean, they were afraid, obviously, you wouldn't wake up. You know, you'd pass out, yeah, and yeah. that would be you, the end you, of it. You got you to keep them awake. As much as I wanted to go to sleep and take a little power nap, that, that was the worst, most dumbass idea I could have had. But, I mean, I'm not thinking correctly. Um, I, you know, I mean, I don't even know half the shit that came out of my mouth may have just been gibberish while they were cheating me. I mean, I can't be hundred percent, but I was mostly coherent for all that for the entire time waiting, you know, I mean, considering the going through an explosion and being high on morphine, but, um, I mean, the whole time it's just like. Uh, you know, you're trying to not think about the shitty situation at hand. I mean, just laying in a freaking laying in the middle of a poppy field next to a tree line in Afghanistan. I mean, this just, ugh, God. Do you remember seeing the helicopter fly in? I didn't see it. I remember, I remember hearing it. And then the big, my buddies remember this too, seeing this big stupid smile come on my face because my buddies were like, dude, it's here. And then I could hear it. And then I could feel all the wind and the rotor wash Mm -hmm. hitting us. And I was like, oh, I've never been so glad to get hit by rotor wash. And so what's all the, the, that's all the debris flying from. It's not like in the movies, you know, people, you know, just walk up to a helicopter. Yeah, obviously. With rocks and stuff. Um, What's the last thing you remember before boarding the chopper? Um, my buddies lifted me up on that, uh, canvas style stretcher we had. They all lifted me up, walked me on and they're like, you know, they're still saying, yo, you're good. We got you, bro. 
you know, I mean, no worries now. You're at home free and everything. And then I remember uh, my buddy Beeman, he almost got <laughs> – they almost brought his ass with them. Frickin' he almost le- he almost didn't get off the helicopter soon enough with his rifle while they were loading me up. And, you know, because they're trying to haul ass back to frickin' – whatchamacallit, the trauma center at Camp Bastion, which is just the British side of Camp Leatherneck. So do you remember the flight itself or no? Like are you passed out? No, they point? they put my ass out. Okay. I I was I guess the medical coma or just right. you know medical sleepy med- medically induced sleepy time. But uh they brought me there. They worked on me at the trauma center. Um our civilian contractor, uh his name is Ricky. He's the one who uh he was at the school we were at, American Canine Interdiction. Uh, they ended up. There was two, or there's two contractor organizations. For those who don't know, it was K2 and then AK9. AK9 got bought out by K2. Ricky worked for both, and he was visiting me at the trauma center before they loaded me up on the plane, along with my battalion commanding officer and sergeant major. When you we were woke up, were you, when you when you woke up, were you in the trauma center, or were you already out of the theater? I woke up in Longstuhl, Germany. Dude. Okay. Yeah, with a Kate Hudson lookalike. At least that's what I, I'm. I swear to God, she Not looked bad. just like Kate Hudson. Hmm. That was pretty awesome. And so when you wake up, who's there? Who do you see? And you know who fills you in on what's going on? Uh, well, the, I start. I hear in uh, this voice. I'm like Brian, Brian. And I open my eyes, and it's just like the first thing out of my mouth was Kate Hudson. What? <laughs> and then she laughed her ass off, and it's like, oh, he can't see straight. That's wonderful. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was pretty much just laying there and falling in and out of sleep up until they're like, Hey, we're putting you on a plane back to the States. I'm like, woohoo, you know, and, but nobody, from there, nobody uh, had told you your condition or anything else and what was intact and what wasn't. And well, I mean, yeah, they, they, they asked, I mean, I was already pretty familiar. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I already knew my legs were gone. I mean, I didn't really care to hear it again, you know. I sure, just, yeah. You know, wanted to chill. But, uh, yeah, man, they, uh, I was there for maybe, I don't know, like a day and a half or so. And then they're like, hey, you're getting on a plane. They put me on a plane with a whole bunch of other. Well, first they loaded me and like probably 30 other dudes. and Same condition I was in, just blown apart all bandaged up they loaded us they got them stacked on the top shelf and the bottom shelf of a school bus so just imagine all the seats are ripped out and along the sides it's just set up for uh stretchers right so you got one on top one on bottom and uh they loaded all of us up on that thing and then they drove us down this god-awful german bumpy ass road up until the flight line and uh yeah then they doped us up and Woke up in the States. And then who was the first person you saw when you woke up in the States? Um, you know, I, I don't even remember who. And I and when I woke up in the States, I woke up, my left arm wasn't really I wasn't really able to use it. But I woke up and my right arm was handcuffed to my bed. And I'm like, what the f and they're like, Well, you see what happened was so I guess when they first got me and when I first got to Bethesda and they were taking me off the plane, they were trying to you know, stick a breathing tube in me. And I guess I was fighting with them a bunch. And then finally they like thought they calmed me down. They're like, Hey, you know, we're trying to put a breathing tube in you. You need to calm down. I guess I kind of calmed down. And then when they went to did it again, I just threw as hard of a right as I could and knocked out one of the nurses. What point in time do you see some family? Uh, my mom was there pretty quick. She, um, let's see, she was there. I don't know. I don't think I was at Bethesda, but a day and a half before you know i saw her but i think she was there i think she was there the entire time i just wasn't awake for it really yet Mm -hmm. um and then we had uh staff sergeant russ he was advanced party back from the deployment he came up and spent time with me too with my mom and you know it was really just uh pretty much just laying there i couldn't really uh i couldn't talk really for uh few days when they first pulled out the breathing tube 
again. And uh, what was it? Staff Sergeant Russ, you know, he's sitting there with my mom and he brought in like, he's like, all right. So I got a few magazines. We got Maxim, this, this, and that. And, you know, and there's, you know, he ended up sitting there reading all the goofy articles at magazines for me and stuff and just hanging out and, you know, flipping channels on TV and being bored, trying to keep the mind busy. At what uh, point in time does like kind of despair set in for you? Like, oh my God, this is now my new life. Um, not really until I got to San Antonio at Bamsey, and that's mostly because, dude, talk about it's like I am missing. You see all this missing off my body. You see that I have abnormal bone growth protruding, like literally. When you get amputated, you have abnormal bone growth. It just grows because it's trying to reconnect to bone, but there ain't shit to reconnect to. So it just starts to grow out of your skin. You got that going on within the first week of being there. my They neglected my wounds so much that necrosis set in. So that's black, dead, and dying tissue. What else? Um, they ripped open wounds that were almost closed. When I told them, hey, that's not a good, that is not what my wound care team at uh, Walter Reed was doing. I'm just going to be an asshole. I'm going to abuse my drugs. I'm going to drink. I'm not going to go to formation. I'm not going to shave. I can't do anything about anything anyway, so I'm just going to wait until I can get out. And that's exactly what I did. And I freaking convinced myself not to blow my own brains out every day, so that was good. I, I mean, I sense the anger, obviously justified. I'm not, I would never tell you it's not, and, and the ordeal that you've gone through you have every right to be uh, angry, but I, I guess the frustrating part is that these people are supposed to be on the same team, and they weren't. So Sorry. No, that's okay. I, I, I don't mind the, the expression of emotion. How do you fight off the thoughts of suicide? Um, drugs. Drugs, drugs, alcohol, alcohol. Just pretty much self-medicate yourself into not really feeling or thinking about much and that'll get you by for a good bit and but it doesn't work very well man it's just it's just that it's it's that same endless cycle you see on stupid daytime television shows about drug abuse or whatever mm -hmm. it's just that's all it is it's so how did how did you know you were down that path and how did you get off it I, I, well, I mean, it's not like a how do you know thing. It's very obvious. If you don't know it, you're just lying to yourself, honestly. I mean, um, when I got I got out, I medically retired in 2013 in August. Um, it didn't take long. I mean, after just being bored, I, I think I what stayed on. Uh, I rented my friend's mom's couch for like a couple months before I found an apartment. You know, so I just gave her a couple hundred bucks a month to crash on the couch. But um, it wasn't long after that that, um, you know, pills, heroin, freaking drinking too much. I mean, and that's just become I mean, it, it just becomes, you know, your daily dose of, you know, poison to freaking put in yourself. And I mean, between between being pissed off about your shitty situation in life and feeling sorry for yourself and being thrashed on all the different substances. It's just, I mean, it's, it's easy to get, you know, kind of in that lost freaking state, I guess. If, yeah, would that be a good way of putting it? Sure. Yeah. Um, but if you, it, it, to sit there and not know it at all, I mean, that, that's okay. just lying to yourself, dude. Okay, so what was what was the the catalyst that you said? Okay, I'm going to change. I'm going to stop this behavior. It's just getting. I, I was getting sick every time. If I don't do heroin, and if it, if I go like five hours without heroin, I start to get not feel so good. Freaking a few hours after that, it is unbearably horrible. I mean, just ugh, vomiting, fucking crap yourself because you can't freaking control everything. Like, you know, it's not like. Oh, I just freaking just started shitting myself. No, it's like I went over, ran, had to roll over to the sink, started projectile vomiting, and then I started freaking sh almost, you know, just shaking pretty freaking almost violently. 
from the withdrawal and freaking during the vomiting and shaking, your body loses control of your butthole too. And then bleh, that's disgusting. But so, I mean, sorry, go ahead. Did you end up going back to rehab? Oh yeah. 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 I freaking just, I mean, I didn't want to deal with being sick. It wasn't, it, I mean, it wasn't like I'm sitting there like I'm going to go live the sober Alcoholics Anonymous life anymore. I was just like, man, being this is misery. So I was just checked into a detox unit, man. So what did you do for your own sort of therapy, if you will, after that? Uh, let's see. Uh, one of my friends that I was a wounded warrior with, we uh, freaking he settled in Dallas as well when he got out. And uh, what's call? I just called him up and was like, hey, uh, so this is what's up, man. I just checked out a detox unit. Do you want to like start going to like Lifetime or something? Like Lifetime Fitness? Was, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just go to like the gym and stuff, you know, to keep busy during the day and try and get relatively healthy again. And he was like, yeah, dude. Excuse me. <clears throat> he was like, yeah, man, fucking – yeah, because he was doing, like, the same stuff I was, only he just wasn't using, you know, a needle with heroin. I mean, he was, but he was the same boat, sick on drugs, freaking not doing so hot, kind of lost in life. And he's like, yeah, man, let's do it. And it wasn't too long after that that I was rolling out of a Jamba Juice and the giant Spartan guy comes sprinting in my direction with the, uh, you know, Dave Vibora with the Adaptive Training Foundation. Yeah, and that's a that's an incredible story. Dave Vibora, former NFL football player, um, as you said, runs the Adaptive Training Foundation. What does he say to you? He just runs up and comes up. He, like, for, I mean, he's just like, hey, hey. And then he just right up. And I'm like, oh, God. Like, you know, like, you know, because my gun is not within arm's reach. And the freaking... <laughs> I'm going to get my ass kicked. I'm going to get robbed. And then he just comes up and he just starts spewing as fast as he can out of his mouth. I'm David Vibora, retired NFL, blah, 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 blah. My biceps have triceps. Freaking. <laughs> and, and then, you know, he's like, what happened, man? And I was just like, ah, well, freaking got blown the fuck up in shitty ass Afghanistan, dude. And he's just like, damn. And we start talking for a little bit. And then he starts showing me videos of him uh, training. Uh, you know Jacob Schick? Yes. Yeah, he showed me a video training Jacob Schick. Um, I don't know if you're familiar. She's one of the civilian athletes that David helped out. Her name is Vanessa. She actually did not walk for like 16 freaking years. And he got her – I mean, obviously she'll use canes and stuff, but she walks around now. Now she's like CrossFit babe doing her thing. I mean – that's, I mean, she was a huge part of why I even agreed to go there in the first place, seeing mm -hmm. her do that stuff. I mean, did you think you would ever walk again when you had first, at this point in time, when you, before you meet David Bode, you're thinking you're never walking again, right? Well, yeah, which, you know, at that particular, when I was first getting out, even when I actually was able to retire, uh, the, my body pain in general was still so horrible. I mean, it, oh, dude. Throwing the thought of putting those prosthetics on just, ugh. Ugh. nah, dude. So, so no. Well, you meet Dave, and and how does he convince you to change your thought process? Well, you know, it's not that he's really tried to convince me to change my thought process on the prosthetics per se. He just wanted me to be physically active in every which way I could, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, we just started with really basic stuff, um, seeing what all, like range of motion. Um, like, can you do, can you do a pull up? So, okay. Yeah, you could do a pull up. Okay. You could do push up. Can you do push ups where you don't have to support the bottom half of your body with something? It's like, okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. You could do that too. Like just, like the way I do push-ups, it's just I just have my hands on the ground and right. that's it. Um, you know, you just see what all what all we could do, what all works, what feels good, what doesn't. And then I was like, you know, what? I'm gonna go try the prosthetics thing. And you know, we did that. We got the legs made. 
Um, I, I don't mean to toot my own horn, man, but you know, I, I did, I did something that as far as I'm concerned, not a single other hip disartic guy has ever done. And that's put on a, uh, cause you know, the difference between the microprocessor knees, the legs that have a microprocessor knee, and then the legs that just have a mechanical knee. I, I, I don't know the difference now. Well, there's the, uh, the C leg and they have the X2 and the X3 models. All right, those have an actual computer in it. You hook it up when you put it on and stuff. They hook it up to a laptop to calibrate it, and that's all based on your height, your weight, um, how you step when you're using them, and it sort of and it and the way the let the knee functions is gonna based on all that information computing through it, you know. But even with all that, they're really not all that. <laughs> they're just not. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, it's it's just amazing that you even wanted to go back down that road. I mean, uh, you've had a, probably a, a hundred reasons not to, but the fact that you are uh, and that you're walking again is is something I think that you know all of us certainly are, are just proud of your efforts and 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 your fortitude for for wanting to go forward with. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it it was just one of those wanting to, you know know I can do it sort of things because um, for practical use the legs are a nightmare they're no for day-to-day -day use it's just not there's absolutely no benefit whatsoever I mean it, within five minutes of steps I've made it from the couch to halfway to my front door and I'm look like I just jumped in a pool so I mean for day-to-day -day use that's just not happening but what was really cool and just knowing that I was able to do that, um, the microprocessor knee, it gives you assistance and it does, and it is smart, you know, it, you can, uh, set different settings on it for whether you're walking slow, walking fast, doing this, doing that. The mechanical knee is exactly what you're making it do everything. It does function similar to the microprocessor knee, but there is no computer. It's just metal moving with metal you know yeah and the way to the, the it's harder to utilize that but what tripped out my prosthetics guy bob and his assistant who was an intern who i forget his name we just called him uh like ashley 2.0 because ashley was the one he replaced um so bob and ashley 2.0 just got tripped out because they slapped that they just wanted to see how i did with the mechanical knee on the left leg and I put it on, you know, got it all strapped up with my hip socket. And then I just started taking steps with it. And they both just look at each other and jaws dropped. And I'm like, what, what I do? And they're like, literally have never seen anybody do that ever, nor have we heard of that. Wow. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Congratulations, Brian. I mean, that's just, that's incredible. Um, you know, I don't think we can say enough, you know, given everything that you went through, just your courage is, is unmatched, you know, and, and your dedication and unwavering and, um, I just thank you for, for your story and sharing it with us. It's, it's, it's incredible. Well, yeah, of course, man. Um, I don't always, I, I don't always like sharing that my feelings about the Bamsey staff, and I probably shouldn't have said all that because not all of them were horrible. A lot of them were some of the most wonderful people I've ever met, but the, my experience, my first year and some change there was, I, I, could not believe that was real. It was like a living nightmare, but you know, um, I mean, I got a great support group here. I got some great friends. I mean, the guys I've met at ATF are some of the best people I've ever known. And it's, I mean, being, I mean, they're not all vets, you know, there are civilians there, but they're great too. And seeing them do their thing, you know, when they could just be sitting at home being a, you know, giant paperweight in a wheelchair i guess i mean they're you know coming in and getting busy and that makes it easier for me to keep going because there's other people to go do it with well again brian yeah it's just amazing i hope you keep fighting the good fight and living your life to the fullest as best as you can uh, we certainly thank you for your service and your sacrifice and and we thank you for being part of the podcast well, i appreciate you having me man You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast. 
hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.